This is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost here in Long Prairie, Minnesota, 2018. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Ephesus, chapter 4. Brethren, be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, who according to God is created in justice and holiness of truth. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, every man with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your anger. Give not place to the devil. He that stole, let him now steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have something to give to him that suffers need. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew, chapter 22. At that time Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the Pharisees in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a king who made a marriage for his son. And he sent his servants to call them that were invited to the marriage, and they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell them that were invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My beeves and fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come ye to the marriage. But they neglected and went their ways, one to his farm, and another to his merchandise, and the rest laid hands on his servants, and having treated them contumeliously, put them to death. But when the king had heard of it, he was angry. And sending his armies, he destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he saith to his servants, The marriage indeed is ready, but they that were invited were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find called to the marriage. And his servants, going forth into the ways, gathered together all that they found, both good and bad. And the marriage was filled with guests. And the king went in to see the guests, and he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he saith to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? But he was silent. Then the king said to the waiters, Bind his hands and feet, and cast him into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Matthew records this parable of our Lord. He would have heard it from his mouth. And our Lord, we hear this every year, and it's really a, a, a summary, a history of the whole Catholic Church. That's what it is in a parable. Who is the King? It's, it's God. Who is the Son? God who became flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the wedding feast? The wedding feast is the eternal happiness of heaven. And Christ, how many times he compares heaven, the joy of heaven, to a wedding feast. And weddings are always happy occasions, most of the time. They're very happy occasions. And the whole, all the families gather, there's great food, there's great, uh, usually great music, innocent dancing, and all the family comes together. It's just joyful. It's a joyful thing. So what must be the joy of heaven? What must be the joy of the angels and all the saints? And the happiness that never ends. And a, and, a, and a feast, our Lord, a wedding feast isn't boring. And heaven is an eternal wedding feast. There is never a boring moment in heaven. This doesn't exist. And in God, you see always the Blessed Trinity, and you always discover in God something new, something incredible, something magnificent, something stupefying and beautiful. Always. Because God is infinite. We're little peanut brains. 
And in God, there's, He's infinite. There is no limit to His goodness, His beauty, His majesty, His everything. And we little peanut brains, we think, well, heaven must be, you know, what, what? we don't really know about heaven. We don't think about it. But we have enough in scriptures to show us the joy of heaven. And it's, it cannot be described. Eye has not seen. Ear has never heard, nor can any man imagine what God has prepared for those who love Him. We can't even imagine it. So, the wedding feast is the kingdom of heaven. And the wedding chamber, we could say, we could say the entrance hall into the eternal wedding feast is our Lord's Catholic Church. And this is why later in this parable, you, you have the good and the bad. Because that's in the Catholic Church, down the history of the Catholic Church, which is the only church Christ established, you're going to have good and bad members. Many good ones who turn bad, many bad ones who repent, contrite, and they come to be good. And they even die holy deaths. So he sent his servants to invite all those that were invited. Who were the ones invited first? It was the Jews. They were the chosen ones. After the, They were the sons of Abraham. And God said, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. And out of your descendants will rise the great Messiah. And Moses knew this. And the Jews, they were supposed to receive our Lord with great love, adoration, and humility. And proclaim him the Messiah. They were supposed to. Some of them did, but most of them didn't. And then they crucified him with their tongues when they shouted at nine, in, at nine o'clock in the morning on uh, Good Friday. They shouted in their furor, fury and hatred, especially the leaders, let him be crucified. We will not have this man reign over us. Let his blood be on, upon us and on our children. So this was all the history of the Jews. God sent them Isaiah. What did they do to Isaiah the prophet? Anybody know? Did he die a peaceful death by the Jews? No, he, he was a Jew himself. And he was warning them, stop sinning, stop offending God, come back to God's laws. And stop committing fornication with false religions. In the, in the scripture, God always compares adultery and fornication to, those, to, to the Jews going to pray with false religions. And this offends God so much. That he, just for fornication and, and for uh, uh, worshipping false gods, God many times slaughtered the Jews. Just slaughtered them. 20,000 at one time. 80,000 at one time. So, <coughs> the history of the Jews is like a roller coaster. They come back to God, and then after 500 years, they turn away from Him. Then they come back to God after they get whacked and spanked, and then they come back to God, and then they fall from Him again. And it's, it's, it's the history of the Catholic Church too, isn't it? After 500 years, Christ has come on earth, men fell from God. God had to raise up Gregory, St. Gregory the Great to rise the church out of its apathy and its, and its falling into idolatry and away from the faith. And so God sends out, St. Gregory sends out all the monks to convert the world. And then after 500 years, men fall back from God again. And then they convert again in the high Middle Ages. And then in the 1500s, Martin Luther, who rebels against Almighty God, rebels against the Holy Catholic Church. Were the men of the church corrupt? Yeah, there were many men in the church corrupt. Were there weak popes who were not good examples? Definitely. But Martin Luther should have imitated the saints. Who, like Archbishop Lefebvre, you stay within the Catholic Church and you build what you can from within. You don't leave the Catholic Church, but Luther left. Luther denied sacrament of confession, sacrament of the sacrifice of the Mass. He hated the Mass. He was a priest, too. He broke his vows, married a nun who broke her vows. And a holy nun in the 1800s saw Martin Luther's hell, soul burning in hell, way down in fire, with devils pounding nails into his head because of his pride. For all eternity, he's got migraine headaches, 
and burning. <clears throat> so, uh, after Luther, the, the, the church has ro rose up again with many great saints at the time of council, the Council of Trent. And then after um, the great Pope St. Pius X, and that period in Our Lady of Fatima, now with Vatican II, we're on an all-time low. We're at an all-time low right now where the apostasy has gripped the very high bishops and even the minds of the popes who are teaching errors and heresies and scandalizing the whole world. So we're at an all-time low right now. But what happens with the Jews? The Jews, after they kill the servants, so what happened to Isaiah the prophet? They cut him in half with a saw. What about Jeremiah, who told them, you've got to stop offending God? And what did they do to Jeremiah? The Israelites, when they should have listened to him, fell on their knees and, and, and uh, repented of their sins with tears, and come back to God and obey his laws again, his Ten Commandments, etc. What did they do to Jeremiah? They lowered him in a septic tank up to his chin. How would you like that? And they didn't have sweet-smelling chemicals in those tanks. And then they killed him. And then they stoned Zacharias. And then they killed many prophets. And so, in another parable, our Lord will say, Surely they'll venerate my son. The king sends his own son. In another parable that's very similar to this that Christ gives. Surely they'll venerate my son. But God, God sends, God becomes flesh himself, and they kill the son. And we can't put all the blame on the Jews. They shouted for his crucifixion by their tongues. The Romans, that is the Gentiles, crucified him by their hands and whipped him and mocked him in, in the crowning of the thorns. But we were all there too by our sins. We were all there spitting on our Lord, whipping him, crucifying him. And he saw that. Our Lord knows each one of us. He knows our in, innermost being and in our thoughts, in our joys and our sorrows. He saw us far from the time of the cross in the future. But what gave him joy was those souls who will truly love him. And those saints who are now in heaven. It was worth going through the butchering of the cross to, to rescue those who love him from hell. And he thought of you also. And we have our chance now. This is it. Our little time on earth. This is it. This is all we've got to save our soul. And if we die in the state of grace, you will save your soul. So live in the state of grace so we can die in the state of grace. Because as we live, we die. As the tree leans, says the Holy Ghost, so it falls. So lean towards heaven. Lean towards God, not to this earth. We all got to fight. We're all tempted. We're all in this war. And we got to pray for each other too. Pray for each other. Pray for our vicar of Christ, the Pope, for his conversion. And that he consecrate Russia, as Our Lady asked. That's the first step. And then we got all these modernist bishops. We got to pray for them. And then our own traditional bishops who are supposed to be doing their duty. And they're not. So we got to pray for them too. And we've got to pray for this whole, this whole fight we're in, and the whole Catholic resistance, which is nothing new. The Catholic resistance goes as far back as, as the Virgin Mary crushing the head of Satan. She was the first resistance to, to oppose the armies of hell. So, they kill the king. Then the king said, he, the, the, finally, and back to this parable, they all made excuses. And the king hears of their excuses. He's angry. He sends his, his armies and smashes the city. This literally happened. Anybody know when? When the Roman armies marched into Jerusalem, sacking the city, burning everything. And even Titus, who was in charge of this job, Titus, the great Roman soldier, he said, he said, there's no way our men could have done this damage. There had to be the hand of God in it, and there was. And in Jerusalem, as Christ foretold, would be destroyed and punished in the year 70. 
that was called the, the, the Great Destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. It was a punishment for deicide, killing God. So then what? <clears throat> then the king sends his servants and he, tell, he tells them, go out everywhere. Just invite everybody into the wedding chamber, into the wedding hall. Just bring everybody in, the good and the bad. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, call them to the marriage. And what is this? It's Christ sending out the apostles, and the apostles ordaining priests, and those bishops ordaining priests. So down to the whole history of the world, there's always going to be Catholic priests, in the lineage of those ordained by St. Peter and the Apostles who will preach the Catholic faith, offer the sacrifice of the Mass, forgive sins and confession, baptize babies, anoint the dying, etc. So my priesthood comes from Bishop Williamson. Bishop Williamson was ordained by Archbishop Lefebvre. Archbishop Lefebvre said his lineage of ordination went back to St. Pius V. And St. Pius V said that his lineage of ordinations goes all the way back to St. John, the, the Apostle. And St. John was ordained by Christ. So this is the beauty of the Catholic Church, is all our sacraments, the Holy Priesthood, is linked right to Christ, physically, in a physical way of laying down on hands and anointing of the sacred oil. So Christ sends the Catholic priests the bishops, and especially the Pope, to hand down the faith. And no Pope has the right to change this faith. They're not allowed to invent anything new and improved in the Catholic doctrine. You girls know when you're given a wedding ring or an engagement ring and it's a beautiful diamond, any jeweler knows you can't, you can't make that diamond more beautiful. If he takes his tools and strikes that diamond just to make one more cut, he'll, ex he'll just shatter the whole thing. So jewelers have to be very careful because it, they can do <clears throat> too many cuts. So they have to know exactly how many cuts to bring the beauty out of the diamond, but not destroy it. Same with the Catholic truth. The Pope's duty and the bishops and the priests is to hand down this diamond of the Catholic faith, which cannot change. It's always beautiful. It's always shining. It's always victorious. It's always leading souls from the pit of darkness and sin and error and heresy to the light of truth and rescuing souls from hell. That's the Catholic faith. And that's the duty of the bishops, the pope, the priests. So what happens? The servants going forth gather them all, bad and good, and, they, and the, marriage fill, the marriage hall was filled. And the king came to see the guests. So this, is, this, this marriage hall is the Catholic Church on earth. It's not yet heaven. And the ones not wearing the wedding garment, as St. Augustine says, these are the souls who are Catholic. They profess the faith, but they're not living in the state of grace. They're living in the state of mortal sin. And just think how many are now encouraged to live in mortal sin by Pope Francis now. Pope Francis with his whole, his whole uh, encyclical, it's not even worthy of the title of encyclical, and his uh, On Marriage, Amores Letizia, which is a real scandal, and allowing divorce, people living in divorce to receive communion. And when they're living in divorce and in mortal sin, and living in a state of mortal sin with a new wife, with a new husband. The, they are, the, that is, that's encouraging souls to commit sacrilege and to live in mortal sin. So it's a huge scandal and we have to oppose these, these new errors. So what happens? The king comes in and he sees these souls in mortal sin and he t tells the waiters, that is the angels, who at their death they're found without the wedding garment, that is, without the state of grace. They're bound in their hands and feet and thrown to the fires of hell. Now, St. Anthony of Padua, everybody loves St. Anthony. And uh, he does say, he comments on this. 
He says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and the burning fires of hell. What is this, he says? Those who die in mortal sin are, are forever cast away from God. And those who die in mortal sin hate God. They hate Him at their death. And they know they deserve hell. And even right now, if Christ was to descend into the flames of hell and say to all the devils and all the damned there, I offer you my forgiveness. I offer you the love of my sacred heart. I give you a new chance. Let's say our Lord did that. He, it won't happen, but let's say He did. You know what the damned would do? You know what the devils would do? They would insult our Lord. They would try to tear Him apart if they could. Because the damned are fixed in hatred. There is so, no love. There is no compassion. There is no contrition for their sins. They're fixed forever in hatred. And that's the pit of darkness. So Christ, even if He offered their mercy, they would hate Him. And that's why we don't want to live in mortal sin. We don't want to die in mortal sin. We want to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And this is not some human emotion. We've got to pray for this. We've got to pray and beg God, move me to love, thy, love Thee, Lord. Move me to love Thy commandments. Because the commandments of God are not straitjackets. They don't reduce your freedom. They're the path to freedom. Because those who follow them, they're really happy and they can fly in the virtues and the love of God and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. They can blossom like a tree with the gifts of the fruits of the Holy Ghost, of which there are twelve, and, and grow in all virtue. And look at all the lives of the saints. Look at all those close to God. They're the happiest people on earth. The suicide rate now is climbing, especially uh, among among. Uh, middle-aged American men the, abort the, the rise of suicide is climbing why? partly because we're just complete, we've lost the faith we've become lower than lost the faith we're becoming unnatural beings killing our babies divorce and now the perversion of homosexuality promoted now even in backed in friendly ways by the Pope himself, hugging these scandalous presidents who bring their, their other to meet the Pope, when he should be punching them out and telling them you're a scandal, you shouldn't be leading your country, and you're leading many souls to hell by your bad example. That's what he should be doing, instead of patting them on the back. And then uh, uh, we're killing our old people. We've become unnatural people, animals. And the youth, the youth, most of the youth are playing video games and, and La La Land and not grounded in any reality. So they're sad, they're miserable, they're selfish, disobedient, rebellious. All the list that St. Paul gives describing people at the end of the world, it's, it's our age, it's our country, it's our people all over the world. So... These people are thrown into hell who die in mortal sin, who die enemies of Christ. And how many die and Christ says to them, you never, you never loved me during your life, you never thought of me, you never sought me, you never kept my commandments, you didn't even want to keep my commandments. You never knew me, I don't know you. Depart from me. Depart from me. So we got to realize we're in this short time on earth. This is it. And many in hell right now are cussing, swearing, cursing their life. And many Catholics too. And sad to say, most likely also traditional Catholics also. Who I blew it. I knew what to do. I knew I had to pray. I had to beg Our Lady. I had to pray my rosary. I had to be going to confession. I had to fight for the faith. I had to not go with compromise. I had to just be faithful to our, our Lord and Our Lady. It was so easy, and I blew it. And they're forever cursing their life. Forever and ever and ever. And uh, when you read the lives of the saints, and many blesseds, and the mystics, such as Sister Josepha Menendez, and St. Catherine of Genoa, and St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, 
These souls, God, Christ allowed them to descend into hell. And they saw hell. And what's really strange is they see in hell people they knew. Fellow Catholics, even priests. So, this is it. This is our chance. Let's not waste it. This is the season. This is, it passes quick. And death can take us any time. So we must be ready. Our Lord warns us. He never, never, ever in the gospel will you find you're automatically saved if you're baptized and believe in Jesus. It doesn't teach that anywhere in the scriptures. Christ never taught that. But what does Christ teach? He says, Vigilate, be watchful, pray, that you don't enter into temptation. St. Paul tells us, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we know not the day or the hour when our death comes. Some have died. A 12-year-old girl died one afternoon at home. 12-year-old girl, she had a heart problem. They didn't know about it. And she dropped dead in her mother's arms. She was a good girl too. She had just gone to confession and communion. She loved Our Lady. She had loved a great devotion to the saints and the guardian angel. She had a beautiful death, 12 years old. A beautiful uh, burial as well. Her family, all Italian, tough guys, they buried the ground with their shovels, shoveled the dirt on the grave, all dressed in black. And the mother on the gra edge of the grave, crying for her daughter. She went almost to fall into the, into the grave hole, weeping. Very, very moving uh, burial which I did a number of years ago. We know not the day nor the hour. How many are taken by sudden death in an accident? How many? We just had the women's retreat. Father Pfeiffer has read out loud the story of Annette. It's a girl who went to hell, a young lady, just married, 20-something years old, just married a few years. Her and Max, her, her, boy, her husband, that morning she said, she said, she was tempted to go to Mass. She was actually tempted to go to Mass. She shut God off a long time ago. And her idol became her husband, Max. And she worshipped him instead of Christ. And they both fell away from the practice of the faith, but they were still Catholic. And that morning she said, I was tempted to go to Mass. And I thought about it actually. And she said, no, oh, it's a beautiful day. She just closed it down. And that day was her last. They got in a car accident, and her soul's now in hell. Annette. And remember, uh, what's her name? Sister Josefa Menendez, in, in March of 1923. She went into hell many times, and she saw a 15-year-old girl there, burning in hell. St. John Bosco saw an 8-year-old boy burning in hell. St. Gregory the Great saw a five-year-old boy burning in hell. And he's still there. So St. Gregory died around the year 600s. That little five-year-old boy is still there burning. And he will always be there burning. And you might say, why a five-year-old boy? They don't know anything. Well, God is not cruel and he's not unjust. In fact, God's mercy outweighs his justice. And God, says St. Alphonsus, in these cases where God cuts by death these young people, why, why does he do this? Because God sees that five-year-old boy who taught to, who learned from his dad to blaspheme God. So his dad probably just said it out of bad habit, not hating God. But the five-year-old boy didn't know that. And he learned from his dad to hate God. So he blasphemed out of hatred of God. Those were mortal sins, a five-year-old boy. So God, says St. Alphonse, saw that this boy, if, if he lives 20 more years, 50 more years, 80 more years, he'll just fall more and more in mortal sin. He'll become worse. So God cut his life very short out of his mercy so that his hell would not be so horrible for all eternity. So God's ways are not ours. And sometimes when he takes young, he spares them. 
Some to take to heaven young, like St. Teresa of the child Jesus. She was 24 years old when she died. Just very young. And St. Maria Goretti, an example of purity. And what we need to be like in these days with so much temptations of the flesh. When she was offered to sin by Alexandro, he was, I think, 19. She was only 12 and, but she was already matured and a beautiful young girl at age 12. Italian girls are mature earlier. And she said, Alessandro, how could we do this before God? We'll throw our souls to hell. And he forced himself on her and she said no. And she kept trying to put her dress down. As the description by Alexandro himself, who later converted and saw her canonized in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. He lived to see her beatified. He didn't make it to the canonization because the Mafia sent him enough messages, don't come here because he won't come back alive. They were still mad at Alessandro for killing <laughs> one of their saints. But she's a saint and he stabbed her 14 times, puncturing her deep with an ice pick, a rusty big long ice pick, stabbed her 14 times through all her body, so punctured her lungs, punctured punk, many of her vital organs. So she suffered an agony of the cross, very much like our Lord in her last hours. All night long, she was dying of thirst, and they, they couldn't alleviate the pain. They couldn't give her painkillers because there were vital organs involved. So she died, she was so thirsty. She was in such pain all night long, and in the morning, when she died on July 6th, I think the year was 1902, if I'm not mistaken, 1902, under the, uh, I think it's Sunday, 1902 or 1912, I stand to be corrected. But uh, she, her mother said, um, Alexandro murdered you. And she said, I know. And I pray he'll be with me in heaven and I forgive him. I forgive him. And she died like our Lord. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. She died saying, Father, forgive him that murdered me. And her soul went straight to heaven. Now, Alexandra was in prison for 30 years, more. And all those years, he always blamed Maria. He was always full of hate. He always blamed Maria. It was her fault, her fault. And finally, he, after 30 years or so, she appeared to him in a dream, giving him 14 lilies, 14 lilies of forgiveness. And Alexandro wept. That night he soaked his bed in his, in his jail chamber in tears. And he begged to see a priest. And he went to confession as soon as he could. He changed his whole life in the prison cell. And, his, and for good behavior, and such a good change of life, he was released. And he spent his years as a lay brother. And when he got out of prison, he went to find Mar Maria's mother, Asunta. She was working as a, as a, as a um, kitchen maiden in one of the priest's houses, at the priest's house. She was one of the kitchen ladies that prepared the meals for the priests. She answered the door when it was knocked, and he was there, Alexandro, released from prison. And he said to her, this is after 30-something years now, so they've all gotten older. And he says to her, do you know who I am? She says, no, yes, I do, I know who you are. You're Alexandro. You killed my daughter. And he said, do you forgive me? And she, she looked down, and she said right away, Alexandro, I forgive you. Because if Maria can forgive you, I forgive you. And they both sat together at the beatification of Maria Goretti. And she was beatified by Pope Pius XII in St. Peter's Basilica. A huge celebration for the church. Later she was also canonized, but as I said, he was uh, warned, don't go. <laughs> so the Mafia never forgave Alexandro, but Maria did and her mother. So these are great examples of the, the great charity, the great virtues we, we need to strive for. Strive for purity, chastity in our thoughts, purity in our dress, ladies, immodest dress. Many girls are in hell because of immodest dress. 
and, but to be strong especially in the faith. Because today, more than ever, we see the fornication, the adultery of the faith. When men of the church, bishops, popes, joining with false religions, praying together with false religions. you know how serious a sin this is? Do you know that you or I, if we go pray with the Jews in their temple and light their candles, it is a greater sin than murder? Did you know that? It's a greater sin than abortion? It's a greater sin than stealing? Because those sins attack God Himself. And it's very true, it's very clear. Christ established one church. Peter, thou art rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. He doesn't say my churches. And that one church will last to the end of the world. And Christ promised it, the gates of hell won't prevail. And many Catholics look around today and say, well, it looks like the gates of hell prevailed. The Pope is a mess, the bishops are all modernists. And even now the traditional bishops are sliding. What do we do? And all this fighting with sedificantes and liberals. And what, what do we do? What's going on here? Where's our Catholic Church? But the Catholic Church doesn't change. The Catholic faith doesn't change. Yes, the men are unfaithful. We pray for their conversion. But the truth still stands. The Ten Commandments are still Ten Commandments. The Seven Sacraments still are the Seven Sacraments of tradition, of course we have, and the Mass is always the same, we have to reject the new Mass, we reject the new sacraments, we reject the new Church, the conciliar Church, we have to, to save our soul. We have to disobey this Pope, we have to disobey our local modernist bishops, because the local bishop here in Long Prairie doesn't want um, the, the traditional faith. He might tolerate the Latin Mass, like many bishops will, but guess what? In those dioceses where they have the Latin Mass and permit the priest permission to have the Latin Mass, so when he comes in on Sunday morning or afternoon, he prepares the, t the altar. They have to move out the table. And then after their indult Mass or motu proprio Mass, they have to set up for the new Mass, which is the ne coming up the next Mass after. So you know what that is? That's called the sin of pluralism. That's putting the true Catholic faith uh, in a niche in the pantheon of all religions. Putting the true faith, the true Mass, equal to the new Mass, equal to all these false religions. And in most dioceses, the bishop allows an indult Mass to please those nostalgic Catholics. But he also has new Mass, and he's got many varieties. He's got the rock and roll new Mass. They've got the children's rainbow Mass when they can bring their puppies into Mass and pet their dogs at Mass with rainbows. Then they got the folk Mass for the 50s and 60s people. Then they've got the pervert Mass for all the, the rainbow flag wavers who should be spanked and uh, straightened out by retreat and uh, warned they're going to hell if they live in this lifestyle and stop scandalizing children and all that. And that goes for truly guilty priests and bishops. They also normally would be executed by the state, according to St. Pius V. The, the true cases of these sins, such as crimes of pedophilia, where they're truly guilty after a fair trial, they need to be punished. And if they're priests or bishops, removed, absolutely removed from the apostolate. That's the, just the way it is. The church law was always this way. So... But in the new dioceses, they got all this soup of all this garbage. And in the middle of it, the Latin Mass. And, and that's why we, Archbishop Lefebvre said, we cannot enter into this world that makes a mockery of the Tridentine Mass, that makes a mockery of the Catholic truth. It's called the sin of pluralism. Pluralism. The all beliefs can exist in the soup of the conciliar church. But that's not the Catholic faith. And that's where Archbishop Lefebvre said, uh, Rome, even if you grant us our Latin Mass, even if you grant us a bishop, even if you grant us to run our seminaries traditionally, we cannot work together because you're working to destroy Christ the King, to de-Christianize society, and we are working to crown Christ the King and re-Catholicize society. We cannot work together. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre stood strong. And that's where we got to stand. The faith of all time. 
And that's what we got to fight. And it's a tough fight, isn't it? We're six years now into this, since 2012, the whole new shift of the faith of Bishop Follet. It's a tough battle, isn't it? It's tough. But happy you who are gaining scars. Happy you who are battling for the faith. Happy you who are, will be found faithful. If we, if we stay faithful, we've got to pray for this every day. So keep your powerful weapon, the rosary. Pray it well. Most families do pray it, that's good. But don't let it just become, oh hum, another routine, like brushing your teeth. Pray it. Pray it humbly. Meditate on the mysteries of our Lord's life and Our Lady. Ask her help. And you young people, you really got to pray. You got to pray. If you don't, you'll burn in hell. And it's easier more than ever to go to hell today. Everybody's going there. The party on earth is, seems exciting. But once death hits, they go wake up into eternal flames. It's not so great a party, is it? So you young ones, pray to the Virgin Mary. Lord, show me your will. Show me what I must do to become a saint. Show me what I must do <coughs> to spread the kingship of Christ. Priests, nuns, monks, and good families. This is what we have to do. We all must rebuild while the others are destroying, as Archbishop Lefebvre frequently said. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.